Celiac artery compression syndrome has a few different names. The first one is called Dunbar syndrome. And the second is called median arcuate ligament syndrome. Celiac artery compression syndrome, aka Dunbar syndrome, and median arcuate ligament syndrome. Some people will say MALS instead of just the entire name. This syndrome is the compression of the celiac artery by the median arcuate ligament. What causes it is that the median arcuate ligament will compress the celiac artery during a certain cycle of respiration, causing a narrowing in that artery and a stenosis as a result. The ligament, this median arcuate ligament, that goes around the aorta and connects the diaphragm to the spine. And it's formed by the left crura of the diaphragm. And the whole reason this is occurring is because during expiration, the diaphragm will raise and will pull the ligament until it compresses on the celiac artery. The physical signs of the syndrome include an abdominal thrill during expiration. You could also say a brewery. That's the physical sign. And the symptoms, there's not really any symptoms, so it's mostly asymptomatic, but it can cause abdominal pain in the epigastric area. A lot of times, this is found on ultrasound as an incidental finding. What happens during this syndrome is that during expiration, the celiac artery is compressed, causing a stenosis of the celiac artery. Then, during inspiration, the median arcuate ligament relaxes off the celiac artery and decompresses the artery, allowing blood to return to normal. During expiration, while the median arcuate ligament is compressing the celiac artery, this causes a stenosis and will decrease blood through the splenic and the hepatic artery. On your boards, they might not say expiration. They might say the patient breathes out or blows all their air out. If the celiac artery were ever occluded in any way, fashion, or form, you'll see retrograde flow in the hepatic artery while blood flow will flow antegrade in the splenic artery. And then blood flow will return to normal as it increases through the celiac artery during inspiration. For the symptoms, they would feel that epigastric pain during expiration. Epigastric pain would resolve during inspiration. Here are the ultrasound findings of Dunbar syndrome. Here we have the long axis of the aorta. We have the celiac artery branching off here. This is the superior mesenteric artery. You can see that the sample gate is placed in the proximal portion of the celiac artery. And this sonographer recorded these waveforms. This waveform here has a peak velocity of 1.43 or 143 centimeters per second. This is normal. A normal celiac artery velocity is less than 200 centimeters per second. The waveform is characterized as having a high velocity and a lower resistant flow, meaning you're going to have diastolic flow all throughout diastole. This image here was recorded during expiration. Look at the difference between this spectrodoppler and this spectrodoppler. The peak velocity increased to almost 300 centimeters per second, while the end diastolic velocity increased to 104 centimeters per second. That's way above the norm, and this signifies Dunbar syndrome. Keep in mind that you maintain the sample gate at the same place for inspiration and expiration. And then if you look at this image here, normal flow will increase, blood flow increases to normal. through the celiac artery. During inspiration, blood flow increases to normal through the celiac artery. And if blood flow is increasing, it's gonna cause aliasing. It's just showing that blood flow increased here. 
this is during expiration, you can see that narrowing right there. This is only aliasing because the blood flow is increasing. It's almost occluded here in this image. We have this image here. And let's say they showed this to you on your boards and they said, this image was taken during what respiratory cycle? This was taken during the expiration. You can tell because we have really high velocities of 3.23 meters per second and an end diastolic velocity of 1.36. Both these images here were taken during expiration. The peak velocity here was 2.01, which is on the low end of abnormal, and this image was taken during inspiration. Both these were expiration, this is expiration, expiration, and this was inspiration. Now tell me this, if during expiration, what will happen to blood flow in the splenic and hepatic arteries? A, increase in hepatic, and splenic artery, B, increase in hepatic, but decrease in splenic artery. Will it decrease in the hepatic and splenic artery, or will it decrease in the hepatic and increase in the splenic artery? C. Exactly right. Now what's the answer? The A. A is correct, good job. Good. What's crazy about the boards is sometimes they won't just give you a straightforward question like this. What happens to the blood flow in the hepatic artery in relation to the splenic artery in a patient with portal hypertension and Bud Chiari syndrome during inspiration. A, hepatic artery blood flow decreases while splenic artery increases. B, hepatic artery blood flow increases while Splenic artery decreases. Hepatic artery blood flow increases while splenic artery increases. Hepatic artery blood flow decreases while splenic artery decreases. Now what? See all these words they throw in there? What happens to the blood flow in the hepatic artery in relation to the splenic artery in a patient with portal hypertension? and Bud Chiari syndrome during inspiration. <laughs> this is, these are the types of questions you can expect to see on your boards. It usually won't be straightforward, especially for the artems, but they'll throw in all these things that are going on and stuff that could be related or, or might affect, you know, blood flow in the hepatic artery or it might not. Uh, and then while you're trying to figure that out, they're saying that the patient's breathing in. Yeah, it's still C. Yeah, try not to get too distracted by a lot of stuff they throw in. Portal hypertension is really not gonna affect the hepatic artery blood flow and the splenic artery flow. Because it's on the different side of the system, venous side. So good. Here's a good question. What happens to celiac artery blood flow after a patient eats? Is it A, increases, B, decreases, C, no effect, or D, negligible change? The celiac artery is not affected by eating. Which artery is? Which artery will show a conversion of high resistance to low resistance? after eating. Now, this question is saying the patient's eating. That means we're not going to be looking at some random artery. We're going to be looking at an artery that's feeding what organ? The stomach, right? Because they're right. eating. Now, look at these options here. Which artery will help feed 
the stomach, do you think? And if you don't know that answer, you rule out the ones that do not. You go, the splenic artery? No, that feeds what organ? The spleen, right? Hepatic artery? No, because that feeds what organ? The liver. The celiac artery? Does that even feed an organ? No, it branches into the hepatic and splenic artery. We just ruled out three options. And even if we didn't know that this was the correct answer or what artery that is, we know that's the correct answer because these are definitely not it. This is what you have to do sometimes when you don't really know the option or the answer. That'll help you a ton. Now let's talk about Nutcracker syndrome. This is compression of the left renal vein between the superior mesenteric artery and the aorta. Other names for this syndrome include left renal vein compression, renal vein entrapment syndrome, and mesoaortic compression of the left renal vein. What you have to know are physical signs of this syndrome. And the first one is called excess protein in the urine and excess blood in the urine. Excess protein in the urine is protein urea. And excess blood in the urine is hematourea. Hemata, hemata, urea, I think. We'll go with that. Unlike celiac artery compression syndrome, these patients are more likely to have symptoms. And these include testicular pain on the left side if they're male, obviously. And if they're female, I believe they will have pelvic pain and then either gender will at least have left-sided abdominal pain but this is what the ultrasound will look like what's this right here we're viewing transverse view with the index pointing towards the patient's right side we have the head the neck, the body, and the tail. Then, just down below here on the image, we have the superior mesenteric artery, and we have the aorta. This is the left renal vein, and you can see how, in this image, it's compressed, and then dilates right here. Then in this image, this is just another transverse view of the pancreas, and you can see the SMA and the aorta compressing the renal vein and you can see the left renal vein right here is dilated. 